Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Not so long ago, international investors here in London saw Nigeria as one of the world's most promising investment opportunities. Well, things change pretty quickly. The slump in the price of oil has hit the Nigerian economy hard. The twin curses of insecurity and corruption haven't gone away. My guest today is one of Nigeria's so-called super ministers, Babatunde Fashola. Will Nigeria ever fulfill its potential? Babatundi Fashola, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. Let's start by reflecting on where Nigeria is today, because just last year you had a democratic transition. The world applauded. There were very high hopes for the presidency of Mr. Buhari. Many of those hopes have been dashed. Why do you think that is? I disagree. Hopes haven't been dashed. Um, change which was the mandate upon which the president was elected, is not an event, it's a process. And people are beginning to see how that process uh, evolves. It, would, it is evolving also in an era where there's a global economic uh, downturn and there will be local consequences. And as I've argued, um, at a time where there was a lot of prosperity, there was money to spend, we made some now regrettable choices. We didn't spend on investments, particularly on infrastructure, and therefore uh, we consumed all our, all our extraordinary income, as I choose to call it. And therefore, when there's a global downturn, the consequences will be diverse from each nation. No nation is immune from what is happening now, and people who are better able to weather the storm now are perhaps those who invested wisely in educational assets, in uh, security assets, in transportation assets, power generating assets, but it doesn't make them immune uh, from, but they will better withstand. So it's like preparing for winter really, mm. but well, at the end of every winter I think there will be a, a very glorious spring. Yeah, I suppose it depends how fierce, how uh, horrible the winter is before you get to spring. And right now, much of the world's attention when it comes to Nigeria and what's happening in your country is fixed on the northeast of your country. And the fact that while you as a minister are responsible for building the infrastructure for a 21st century country, you actually, in the northeast of your country have at least two million people who, according to the United Nations, are living on the brink of starvation. How can that be? Well, first of all, um, again, I, I have issues with those numbers. There are people who are displaced. Um, but the point to make also is that there's progress now in the northeast. The president has fulfilled his mandate to um, taking control of the security challenges of the Northeast. Well, we, and if you, Minister, move, he, if you he, move from he, a situation he, of as war... As far as the world is concerned, he hasn't delivered on his promise because he very clearly promised to deliver victory over Boko Haram by the end of 2015. And here we sit in the summer of 2016, and there are still clashes, still bomb attacks, still Boko Haram uh, atrocities committed against your own civilian population long after this war is supposed to be over. I think what you will see today is the emergence of uh, an unconventional enemy of the human civilization evolving even on the streets of some of the most sophisticated parts of the world in Europe. And, 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 uh, and leaders are really challenged now in terms of restoring order to the Northeast. I believe that the evidence that speaks today of people beginning to trade again on the streets of Bornu, in Damaturu, in Yobe, construction going on in Adamawa, 
that I am aware of, roads being built means that order has returned. Well, I don't now, know about with, order. I'm talking about dealing, dealing the, with, the MSF chief in Borno saying, we are talking about areas in which 40% of the children have severe acute malnutrition. It is a truly dramatic situation. In my whole career, she says, since 1999, I've never seen anything like it. That's the reality of If your you have today. prolonged war, if you have prolonged war where women and children have been displaced by a mindless group of terrorists, some of the aftermath of that war will be that it is children who are vulnerable, who would have malnutrition, who would be out of school, who would have health, health issues. Now, securing law and order is the first leg to being able to provide for those children, to, to put them back, to relocate families back to their homestead, and to help sure. them get on with their lives. So that is work in progress. Provision of those basic services requires a strategy. It requires forward thinking. I would put it to you that your government, and after you're, you're the public works minister, apart from everything else, your yeah. government, according to some of your own fiercest critics in the country, for example, Grema Terab, chairman of the State Emergency Managing Agency, until 2015, he now says, looking at the northeast of your country, this crisis is the result of, quote, total neglect and carelessness on the part of the government. The result that you see today is a total neglect by the government that was in charge that did not frontally address the issue since 2010, allowed it to fester, pretended that it didn't exist. And what you see today first is that from a period when these criminals took over state apparatus, police formations, local governments hosted their flags, they are now at a point where they are attacking uh, vulnerable citizens and markets and places and that is the conventional nature of the warfare that the whole world is dealing with today. An enemy that is ready to die, not an enemy that wants to survive. But that, you would agree that that enemy is not defeated. Despite what Buhari that promised, it is not defeated. has been defeated and in its retreat, it is now targeting very, very vulnerable people, places where people get on with their lives, marketplaces, schools, and so on and so forth. The agencies I've talked about at the UN, Médecins Sans Frontières, they say, and it's their phrase, not mine, that there are millions of people on the brink of starvation. Can you guarantee to me, as one of the so-called super ministers in your government, those people, including hundreds of thousands of children, will not be allowed to starve? I guarantee that that would not happen, and this is going to happen, and is already happening, as a result, first, of government taking responsibility at national level, state governments taking responsibility, and Nigerians, civil society, voluntary agencies coming together, providing support, restoring the office of the vice president, has an officer and a team of people, really, focusing on getting life back to normal for these vulnerable women and children in terms of education, in terms of vaccines, in terms of medicines, mm. in terms of food supplies. Uh, in the last three to four months, the president himself ordered release of food support from our strategic reserves of agriculture. You know, so we're mindful of the problem. Let's move on to national economic issues and let's talk money. Nigeria's most profound economic problem is that you are super reliant on your oil exports. 95%, I think, of your export revenues come from oil. 70% 70 I think of your government revenues come directly from oil. The price of oil has plunged over the last two years. That has left all of your economic planning in ruins, hasn't it? No, I disagree. Uh, we used to be reliant on oil proceeds. Well, you're but not quarrelling with my figures, but, are you? But, I mean, you're still I, super I quarrel, reliant I quarrel with the figures because the, the point is this government has indicated very clearly that its budget will be driven by resources from taxation. And any serious government, any forward-looking government like this government must understand that the boom that comes from commodity prices really is extraordinary income. You can't plan a future around extraordinary income that you don't control the cycles. And yes, whilst we may have made some very poor choices over the time about how we spent that money, clearly this administration has a focus now that we will deal with our funding issues first from taxation, corporate taxation and all of that. And the 
Unlike in the past where we were budgeting to earn about $70 per barrel of oil, this was a very conservative oil supported budget of $38 per barrel. Even at that time, it was trading at yeah, more than that. It, it's not just about the price, it's also about the, the capacity and delivery of, of the oil you've got. For example, you know, we talked about security in terms of Boko Haram. Yes. You've now got new security issues in, in the Delta with a, a new group, the, the so-called Delta Avengers, who are attacking pipelines. And again, for you as a minister responsible for infrastructure in the, your country, how can you defend the fact that Shell, Chevron, other key producers have had to stop production because a new brand of militants are destroying the infrastructure? Well, I understand that uh, the problems there now and the people who are aggrieved and who have chosen uh, a very uh, unencouraging outlet to vet their anger, but it is not something that would endure forever. And uh, government... They, they say their government, campaign government, is going to get worse. They say, you've, you've basically, to paraphrase them, you ain't seen nothing yet. Well, that, 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 is, that is not unusual to hear by a group that wants to, to project and, uh, and be seen to be some group to be, to be taken seriously. But I know that we are working hard to engage with them and also to secure, because there's an obligation first to secure the, the, the assets there. Those but assets the, 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 are national assets. But Minister, what I want you to as, do is, as, is as address... national patrimony. I want you to address realities. I mean, the, the insecurity has cost you, I think, uh, roughly a quarter of your oil output. Without in, a in doubt, we've lost, we've, lo we've lost some of our... Yeah, some so, of our, so, so some here of you are, you sit... revenues, you, but we are coming back. Well, you sit with me... Production as, is, is improving. Well, until the next round of attacks. But you sit with me as the minister responsible for delivering uh, a much more efficient and um, expansive power system, roads, infrastructure. That's your job. But yeah. the government doesn't have the money. The oil price has dropped. Oil production has dropped because of the new insecurity. So where are you going to find the money to deliver on all of your promises? We, we are funding our budget already. Um, last month, we paid out about 63 billion naira to contractors who haven't been paid for two years. Certainly we could be in a better place, but we are making progress. Well, you need to make more than just a bit of progress. You need to go an awful long way, particularly I, I, in I terms did, of power generation. I didn't, say, I didn't say we made a bit of progress. We are making a lot of progress. Well, I'm because saying a bit because in, I'm looking in the at the context, figures. In the context of where we were coming from, paying out 63 billion to contractors who haven't been paid for two years is the best way to start to get your infrastructure back in place, get people back to work, get production going, and begin to rebuild your economy. Well, that, it, didn't it, happen, it, that didn't happen in a whole budget cycle from the government we inherited administration. Here's from. What, is so the, this, is a, this is the first quarter, uh, this is the first quarter performance. Well, here's what Eze Onyepere says. He's the senior lawyer working for the Center for Social Justice in Nigeria. He says, we aren't seeing a single contract mobilizing. Delays have meant that work on road power and other programs has stalled or come to a halt altogether. I don't know when that statement was made, but uh, if you go onto the major highways from Lagos to Ibadan, from Kano to Katsina, Enugu, Potakot, Jeba to Ilori, contractors have moved back to yeah. San and they're working and they're re-engaging people. You said by the end of this year, you'd be getting to 6,000 megawatts. There have been times in the recent past where your entire generating system has actually not even delivered 2,000 megawatts. So you're never going to meet your targets. Our generation capacity has hit 5,000 megawatts. Of course, there has been sabotage that we have you have sabotage, you have outages, you the, have, you the have grid, the, the, a grid the, that is the, obsolete. The grid isn't obsolete. The grid is being rebuilt and expanded and developed as I speak at the moment. And uh, there's a lot of work going on since I came on uh, to expand and strengthen the, the grid. The SCADA is being, is being upgraded. So there's a lot of work going on. We're in season essentially of running repairs, trying to make what we inherited work and I am optimistic that it will work. You seem again to be a little undecided how over the next 10, 20 years you're going to deliver this massive upsurge in, in power generation. At one point you talked about renewables, you said solar was Nigeria's future and then recently I got this quote from you, we are going to do a lot more gas and a lot more coal. We really feel 
uh, that coal has to be part of our mix. It isn't right now, whereas in South Africa and the US there is 30% coal. We need to do it too. I mean, have, did you not follow the Paris Climate Summit? Did you not buy into the idea that we're all decarbonizing the global economy? I have made the point repeatedly that if we have the capacity to deliver coal, if we have the capacity to deliver gas, if we have the capacity to deliver hydro and solar power, why should we be limited? What is important is the mix and the content uh, that it produces. And there are nations who have no other capacity or very limited capacity to deliver any sort of so power. So you will exploit other than, coal as far we will, as you can? We will. Because Never mind first, the Paris we, we, Never we will mind survive. We have to survive first in order to be a part of the global economy. And we will also keep our commitment. Let's talk now about delivery. You've got a strategy and you are very ambitious with your targets for power generation over the next 15, 20, 25 years. You tell me you're going to use all of the available means to do it, including coal. But there's one overriding problem that we haven't discussed. And it covers your sectors, it covers the whole economy, and that is corruption. Corruption, and again Mr. Buhari has said it himself, is killing Nigeria. Well, I think that the 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 clear evidence is that we, we could have done better in the way that we enforce law and order. I think that corruption is a symptom of a larger problem of non-compliance. And therefore, I would focus on law and order and in such a way that compliance becomes a way of life. And people who fail to comply really are those who then scandalize us. And, um, for me, there is no, no corruption-free country. It's a clash between law and order, really, and enforcement and the lack of it. And the more of that we see uh, in our procurement process, in our way of life, in, in how open and transparent we do things, the better off we will mm. be. Well, if it comes to enforcement, uh, obviously Nigeria must be pretty much at the bottom of the global league table. I, just, I wonder how you felt when just a very short distance from here, just a few short months ago, then Prime Minister David Cameron saw your boss, President Buhari, entering a room and said he thought privately, although it was on a microphone, we've got some leaders of fantastically corrupt countries <laughs> coming to Britain. Nigeria and Afghanistan, possibly the two most corrupt countries in the world. I, I, I think that the former prime minister was speaking uh, uh, perhaps uh, tongue-in-cheek because if this, well, country, I don't, I don't think if, if this country plays host to, to the reception of... Uh, uh, stolen, stolen property, as it were. Um, I think there's a moral issue. There's a very strong moral issue. And if I remember my criminal law, it's as much an offence to receive stolen property as to actually steal it. And I think that all of those who make those kind of comments and become bastions and harbour for 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 uh, proceeds of corruption need to do everything. But that is in the past. Well, I think yeah, the president I mean... has said clearly that he's not interested in an apology, he's interested in having the money back. So if you have something that's stolen, please give it back. Well, i tell you what the president said recently, which I'd like your opinion on. He said, because he has been seen, you know, he, he fought the election on an anti-corruption ticket, and he said recently, I am worried that the expectation of the public is yet to be met by the judiciary with regard to the, remo to, for, to the removal of delay and the toleration of delay by lawyers, i.e., what he's saying is the judiciary isn't doing its job and coming down like a ton of bricks on people, very powerful people, who are still, in your administration, conducting corrupt practices. I don't think that uh, the judiciary isn't doing its work. I think that all of us understand that uh, there must be process to prosecution and uh, you can't break the law to enforce the law. And people's rights, constitutionally guaranteed rights, must be respected in this. And, that, and that's not a local problem. There's also an international problem dimension to this. All of the proceeds of crime mm. held abroad are also tied up in one form of judicial process where prosecutors actually get rewarded well, I for, for, for what they seize. For recovering assets yes. and things like that, that's really important. But, but to actually crack down on the perpetrators in your own country, that's down to you guys. And the question well, is are, whether you're serious. I mean, listen, are they, doing that contrary, are you, contrary Transparency International has you close to the bottom of the league table for corrupt nations right now. And their chief coordinator in West Africa said the other day, ending the impunity is about political will, 
because those benefiting most are amongst the ranks of the leaders. People, I, may I, I say, think, such as yourself, in government. You're the guys who many Nigerians feel I are think still implicated. The, I think that the government has shown clear will. I think that you will see in the number of charges that are being, that are being brought against people who were hitherto uh, thought to be above the law. And, um, Can you name, I, me, I, any, I, name I think, me anybody who I, was thought to be above the law who's been brought before a court? I think that the evidence out there, uh, former security advisors, all of those party, party chiefs and all of that, I think the point to make mm -hmm. is that locally, by rating, the people of Nigeria think that the president has walked his talk in terms of corruption. Do you think now, so? how many people you, you ultimately see in jail is one thing. And I think that the, the point must be made very clearly, too, that there are many interests here involved. The interest to see people convicted, the interest to recover, and the interest to ensure that it won't happen again. And all of these are going on simultaneously. You sound and that not, people you, believe that there will be consequences for action. Do you think the people of your country really trust people like you? I think they do. Even when they read, and you were a popular mayor, you got re-elected, uh, governor, excuse me, of Lagos uh, province, you, you got re-elected. So you had a good political track record. But after you left office in 2015, there were serious questions asked even about you. You spent 70 million naira on upgrading your website. You spent 600 million naira on a German engineering firm coming to improve the car park outside your official residence. People began to wonder whether even you had been abusing the public trust. Yes, uh, the point, the point, my response, I have made my response on those matters. If anybody truly believes that I acted in any improper way, and I've made the point here today that we need to be circumspect and very careful while whistleblowing and transparency is all very good. Mm. We need to also understand that some people have worked very hard in their lives to earn their reputation. And um, people who make those kind of allegations must also be ready to stand up and verify them at least. Are they, are they, I mean, Minister, uh, 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 you, you, here's your chance. Are, so, are they not... I mean, nobody you, has in your accused country, me, most people earn less than $2 a day. Me, nobody has accused me of privately benefiting myself. There were allegations that I think, at the, at, at, at the very best, were a clear misunderstanding of how the procurement process worked. Let me end then by asking you, as one of the most senior, powerful ministers in the government in I'm Nigeria I'm just a today, minister in the government. Well, you've got three portfolios, so you're doing pretty well. That I doesn't know. make me powerful. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me responsible. Well, however you want to put it, let me ask you this. I've been travelling to Nigeria for hard talk for many years now, more than a decade. Every time I go, I hear Nigerians telling me that this is going to be our time. We are going to be the economic powerhouse of Africa. And yet, look at the reality today. Foreign direct investment down. It seems like Ivory Coast, one of your neighbours, is actually right now more successful at attracting inward investment than you are. Oil output down so that Angola has actually overtaken you as the biggest oil producer in Africa. Look at various metrics. Nigeria is failing to fulfil its potential. My response to foreign direct investment is simple, that uh, no country survives on her own investment, but every country thrives first on the investment of her people. And as long as first Nigerians are responding and investing in that economy, I think that we will turn this corner. As I said in the opening part of the, 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 the discussion, uh, there's a global downward trend, national, national growth projections are being revised downwards, and in these very difficult global times, there will be diverse local consequences. Ours is no but different. But Nigeria they is the underperforming. The, we're not underperforming. We're facing a turbulent time, a difficult tide, but we will navigate, we will come through. And I see that happening within a shorter time than a longer time. We have to end there. But Babatunde Fashola, thank you for being on Hard Tool. Thank you for having me.